It's March 2018. Commuters on Montreal's south shore notice construction work going on. Perhaps some roadworks, or one of the new condo projects. But it was the first preparatory work for the REM, the new 67 kilometer long rapid transit network. For many in the know, this hypothetical project from Quebec's pension fund, The Case, was suddenly very real. And so were their concerns. Should Quebec's pensioners trust this project with their retirement? And then on the other side of the deal, would the younger urban folk benefit? Or was the private sector building fast, but privately pulling a fast one? Now the private sector works with the government to build infrastructure all the time. Effectively all transit systems are a deal between the government and industry. Even communist China contracts out the building of subway lines. It's not like the guys spreading salt on the road are told at the end of winter, hey guys, uh, time to start digging the subway, we'll bring you shovels. But this approach of contracting has obvious problems. The main one is management and accountability. Usually you have many companies doing small parts of a project. The architecture firm designing the stations, engineering firms ensuring that it physically works, the supplier of trains and all the different construction companies building different parts of it. These projects are small cities of workers brought in from across the planet. And overseeing all of this, holding the public credit card, a group of government employees who often haven't seen a subway built in their city for 30 <laughs> years. During their heydays of growth, cities like New York, Paris, and London built a whack load of rapid transit at a reasonable price. They built good, practical, institutional knowledge about managing contracts. You know, what seems suspicious, what to expect. You get better with practice, and your contractors get better at working with you. All of this means prices come down. We seldom think about it because we do it so regularly, but this still happens with lots of infrastructure. We're pretty good at constructing roads and electrical grids and sewage systems at a reasonable price. The problem with mass transit is it needs higher densities to work, and cities run out of unserved high density at some point. The arrival of a car meant fertile, high density soil for a rapid transit project stopped being produced altogether in many cases. They kind of hit peak project, people moved on to other tasks, and that institutional know-how was lost. That loss of production line efficiencies made any new shit really expensive. You can end up in a downward spiral where each project costs more, so less get built, so they cost even more, so even less get built. Recognizing various shortcomings, to their credit, governments have been trying to figure out how to handle this. One approach has been to make the private sector have more skin in the game as an investor. By getting the private sector to be financially on the hook, you reduce the public risk and increase the oversight. More parties want it to arrive on time and on budget, and they hold the various contractors to account and look for cost efficiencies. This arrangement is called a public-private partnership, or P3. Lots of these have been done, and although the ideas sounded good on paper, they've been a pretty mixed bag. I found P3s horrible to research because the companies that want to do them and the left-wing think tanks that don't want to see government jobs getting outsourced have very strong opinions about the whole thing. P3s are the worst! And then they find like another, you know, aligned left-wing think tank and they're like, see, these guys also think they're the worst! And then you go to the industry side and there's an entire separate alternative reality ecosystem of their think tanks being like, they're the best! Everyone should do these all the time! Anyway, here's my read for what it's worth. When the government realized that it had an issue managing construction projects, at first, a partnership with the private sector seemed like an easy solution. But they kind of swapped one shortcoming for another because they also weren't very good at writing partnership agreements with the private sector. You'll notice places like the World Bank create extensive manuals on how to structure these partnerships nowadays. And I think over time, P3s have gotten better as the holes have kind of been plugged and best practices have been established. But the biggest problem with P3s that I don't see them getting past anytime soon is political. Even when the deal is fair, the public resent that the money coming off their infrastructure is going into the pockets of some company. I don't really like that my infrastructure is technically owned by this Saudi-linked private equity fund. Which is understandable. And then sometimes, of course, the deal is just not fair. For-profit global corporations. Shocker. They can be bad guys. We're talking bribes and corruption, shoddy work. So let's introduce the innovation that the case came up with that attempts to solve the enterprise gap 
for calming these concerns. They dorkily call it the public-public partnership. You see, the case benefit from its unusually close but legally separated relationship with the government. The case is an institution publicly owned by Quebec, founded by the National Assembly in 1965. The government can work with them, lean on their expertise and trust them more than they would a private company. It's easier to loan them money and it's not lining billionaires' pockets, which helps with that uncomfortable feeling many get with traditional P3s. But they're still independent. Their mandate is first and foremost an 8-ish percent return so grandma can retire. Interfering with the case means changing legislation and having a public debate. It's not as simple as a politician making a phone call and giving a marching orders to go buy my uncle's shovels for some project. However, the option to change those things is always there. They can make their returns and solve their problems, but shafting the public forever with bad infrastructure just isn't politically an option. If the deal is notoriously bad, a political party could run on amending the law and require the case to, say, divest the assets to the city at a reasonable rate. That means the REM is a transit P3 with an emergency break built into it. We live in a democracy and all parties in this deal are ultimately accountable to citizens if we want it. So that addresses a lot of citizens' concerns, but the opportunity which gets me most excited is addressing the institutional knowledge problem. The case has money and permanent staff who plan and manage infrastructure construction. They aren't a cash-strapped government department that doesn't even have the money to put together the plan to ask for money. They also show up with cash. So it's like, here's a workable plan, here's half of the cost. For example, there have been several cost increases during the first REM project. A fun one was due to old explosives detonating in the Montreal Tunnel. Who is going to pay for that? The case. Who is motivated to make sure it doesn't happen again? The case. It's their problem to solve, their shortfall to make up for, but critically, it's become their lesson to learn for pricing the next project that involves old infrastructure. And that is the big change here. Any given city in the country doesn't have a limitless set of transit to build, but overall, across 10 cities, there effectively is enough work for some shared institution, a well-oiled Canadian machine with tens of projects under its belt that multiple cities can tap into. This is potentially the post-industrialization project manager that we've been looking for. Verem in Montreal isn't some Dubai-esque project. The government didn't open a briefcase of money and see who would drop by to build the thing. Oh, thanks! See you next decade for the next tunnel, guys! It's a project that aims to kickstart an industry. Instead of taking old money and making them richer, it's taking old people's money and enriching their society. So yeah, in Montreal, boomers should love transit. Even if you don't ride it yourself, you'll know people who are, and your pension is helping to build a new industry for the city's future. But the case, making a good return, all depends on how the project goes. The preparatory work in 2018 was just some marks in the ground. The real challenge would show up later that year, when the political bulldozers arrived and undermined the integrity of the entire enterprise. I'm turning corners, I'm moving back